from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Today's program is presented by the John W. Kluge Center at the Library of Congress. The Kluge Center is a vibrant scholar center on Capitol Hill that brings together scholars and researchers from around the world to stimulate and energize one another, to distill wisdom from the library's rich resources, and to interact with policymakers and the public. The center offers opportunities for senior scholars and postdoctoral fellows to do research in the Library of Congress collections, as well as doctoral candidates. And we offer free public lectures, conferences, symposia, and other programs, and administer the Kluge Prize, which recognizes lifetime achievement in the fields of the humanistic and social sciences. For more information about the Kluge Center, please visit our website, loc.gov kluge. And I invite you to sign up for our RSS email list. There's a sign-up sheet uh, right at the table when you walk in or exit. And you can also sign up from our website. I will let you know about future programs and as well as opportunities for you to conduct your own research here at the library. Today's program is titled The Myth of Wilderness, What's Left to Save and What Never Existed. The event is part of a, a new brand of scholarly conversations that we're hosting at the Kluge Center called, appropriately enough, Kluge Conversations. One of the wonderful aspects of convening such a diversity of top scholars from around the world under one roof is the serendipitous synergies that emerge. When scholars from different disciplines researching diverse topics begin talking to one another, it's remarkable how many commonalities can be found. In this instance, we have a literary scholar and an astrobiologist whose work, it turns out, both investigate and uncover myths and realities about the ideas of wilderness and how it informs our conversations and narratives in both fields. So that is what our conversation today will be about. A word about the run of program. Uh, we've asked each of the two scholars to offer a brief five to seven minute overview of their work and its relevance to this particular topic. The scholars will then engage in a conversation that will last for approximately 20 to 30 minutes, after which we will open it up to Q&A with you in the audience. Both of our scholars are very eager to engage you in this conversation and hear your thoughts, so we will leave plenty of time for questions, and we'll conclude at approximately 1 p.m. And finally, before we begin, I should introduce both of the scholars. I'm going to offer brief biographies However, please note that both of these accomplished scholars deserve a much longer biography and introduction that I'm going to offer. So please visit our website to learn more about them and their work. Immediately to my left, Charlotte Rogers. Charlotte is an assistant professor at George Mason University and a scholar of Latin American literature and culture, comparative literatures, modernist studies, and post-colonial literature. Dr. Rogers received her MA, MPhil, and PhD from the Department of Spanish and Portuguese at Yale University. Her first book, Jungle Fever, examines representations of the jungle in 20th century works in French, Spanish, and English. As a Kluge Fellow here at the Kluge Center, she is researching her second book, which will examine literary works from Brazil, Colombia, Peru, and Guyana and the reinvention of the myth of the fabulous city of gold known as El Dorado in today's world and in the wake of deforestation and settlement in the Amazon River Basin. She will lecture on this topic here at the Kluge Center on Thursday, June 19th at 12 p.m. Next to her is Dr. David Grinspoon, whose biography and intro could take up the entire hour we have. <laughs> Uh, David is a well-known researcher in planetary science and author of Lonely Planets, The Natural Philosophy on Alien Life. He's a former curator of astrobiology in the Department of Space Sciences at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, and he held the inaugural Baruch S. Blumberg NASA Library of Congress Chair in Astrobiology here at the Kluge Center. As chair, uh, Dr. Grinspoon used the library's collections and resources to research and write his forthcoming book on the Anthropocene era, which will be a direct result of residency at the Kluge Center. David has played an enormous role as an ambassador for astrobiology, 
as chair, meeting with members of Congress, delivering several high profile lectures, appearing in dozens of media outlets, and hosting a day long symposium here in September of 2013 on the longevity of human civilization, which featured scientists, scholars, authors, and journalists. In 2014, he has continued his residency at the Kluge Center as a distinguished visiting scholar. So, without further ado, Charlotte will start us off. Okay, thank you very much, Jason. Uh, and thank, to, thank you to all of you for coming today. Uh, I'm looking forward to our conversation and to have you uh, with us as we bridge the gaps between the humanities and the sciences. Um, so I am using my time here as a Kluge Fellow at the Library of Congress to write a book about the myth of El Dorado in contemporary Latin American literature. At first, that sounds like a very far cry from astrobiology um, and the Anthropocene era. But I think that um, our work shares a common thread, which is that we are both interested in interrogating the notion of the wilderness. Um, so, what is the myth of El Dorado and how does it relate to this idea of wilderness that we're talking about today? El Dorado in Spanish means the golden one. And it's a term that refers to a myth that arose in the 15 and 1600s when the Spanish colonizers arrived in the New World and heard an indigenous legend about a wealthy king who was so, um, had so much wealth that he could bathe in an Amazonian lake, emerge, and then anoint himself with golden powder. And that was his only article of clothing. Um, so he was called the Golden One. And for centuries, uh, Spanish and other European colonizers sought this legendary kingdom of gold. Um, of course, it goes without saying that that search was always fruitless. Um, the important thing about El Dorado for us today is that it has never been found. It is an elusive goal um, that symbolizes wealth, happiness, and justice. Um, so after a few centuries, the idea of a physical place of El Dorado was extinguished, but it maintained its figurative importance in culture. Um, and I argue in my book that Amazonia, that, um, the wilderness in the central part of Latin America, has taken on um, qualities of an El Dorado for scientists and conservationists. And this is because of its superlative biodiversity um, and its statistics as the largest rainforest in the world. Um, so for scientists, uh, Amazonia is a kind of El Dorado because it is seen as a pristine, untouched, natural environment. Now, I'm very interested in the culture and art and literature made in Amazonia since 1960. Um, around that time, Amazonia became developed on a very large scale. Um, it's famous in this country in the 1980s for having um, photos of satellite imagery of fires burning that are visible from space. Um, in fact, the advent of technologies like satellite imagery and now the application of Google Earth makes it so that we can see all of Amazonia all the time. Um, the idea of an undiscovered magical kingdom is now completely obsolete. There is no chance for El Dorado to still exist in the wilderness. Um, and that possibility of the untouched wilderness is uh, the impossibility of it, I should say, is really important for um, cultural production right now because we have to confront the loss of that myth. Um, and that's why the title of my book is Mourning El Dorado because I believe that we're in a period of cultural bereavement in which we are mourning the loss of our idea of the wilderness. Now, it's very important for me to note here that the idea of Amazonia as an untouched natural world is completely unfounded. Recent archeological studies show that humans have had a presence in Amazonia for at least 11,000 years. 
there is a debate raging in anthropology and archaeology as to to what extent early pre-Columbian Amazonians affected their natural environment. However, there is evidence for human settlement there throughout many centuries and long before the arrival of Europeans. So that led me to ask this question in my research, which is, why is this idea of an untouched, pristine environment so powerful in our culture? And what I've found through my research is that there is a direct parallel between the rhetoric that explorers and scientists use to talk about virgin lands and the kind of vocabulary that is used to talk about virginity and deflowering of Amazonian women throughout history. Um, I usually discuss this topic at conferences full of Latin American men, and it makes them all very uncomfortable. And I think it's really, that's an important sign that we should be talking about this and asking the idea um, as to why are we mourning the loss of virginity in both lands and people. Um, in that sense, Amazonia is now a fallen woman, right? She's damaged goods. Um, and that really comes through in the literature that I'm reading, this sense of, of after the fall, what happens. Um, so I argue that the, uh, the loss of the myth of El Dorado offers a very bleak future for us unless we are willing to let go of the priorities that we put on virginity um, and pristine territories in our whole planet. So thank you very much, Jason. Thank you. Yeah. David. All right. Thank you, Charlotte. And mm -hmm. thanks, Jason. And um, I would just like to echo what Charlotte said uh, at the beginning, that, that working here at the Kluge Center has uh, it's been a great experience in a lot of ways, but one of the ways that sort of surprised me is uh, how the sort of unexpected connections between disciplines have uh, challenged me and enriched my work, being in, in close proximity to other scholars who are following their passions, however seemingly divergent, and you end up having these lunchtime conversations and realizing that there are, are surprising intersections. So, so that's been great. And um, in brief, as Jason mentioned, my project here has been um, about the, uh, the Anthropocene era from an astrobiological perspective. Well, what the heck does that mean? The, the Anthropocene is the name that geologists and now actually scholars and people from a lot of other areas of interest are using to describe the geological era that we are currently in, the idea that the collective actions of humanity have now become a geological force on a par with the other great forces of nature, and that to see the world we inhabit clearly, we have to recognize that. So uh, geologists are debating whether to give it a new name. While they debate, the reality is that we do live in this world that is undeniably altered by humanity uh, and that in order to see ourselves and our connection with our past and our potential futures clearly we have to fully recognize that perhaps even embrace it uh, and and the uh, the working title of the the book that that I'm uh, writing about this is Terra Sapiens which literally means wise earth and it's sort of an aspirational vision. And it's really, you know, you could put a question mark on it. Are we, are we capable of uh, integrating this knowledge of our role in the earth and, and uh, acting wisely upon that? Or is that very vision a kind of El Dorado? <laughs> um, remains to be seen, I suppose. But at any rate, my approach to that as an astrobiologist, so astrobiology is the scientific study of life on other planets uh, and life elsewhere in the universe, the potential for life, but a lot of it involves studying life on our planet and its history and patterns and qualities and trying to understand the relationship between life and a planet and then trying to understand what we can about planets elsewhere and putting all that knowledge together to assess the possibility that life on Earth is not a singular 
thing, but is in fact a local example of something that may be mm. a, a phenomenon that exists wide, widely in the universe. And even, I almost said wisely, but mm. <laughs> widely. But then <laughs> the question of whether it exists wisely in the universe is sort of the, the next part of that. If this transition that we're encountering on Earth now to uh, perhaps a new phase in the evolution of the planet where uh, so-called intelligent technological life has now become a factor in how the planet itself operates, one can ask, is that something that might mm. obtain elsewhere in the universe? And how does even posing that question uh, affect the way we think about ourselves and our future on this planet? Mm. Um, so, I, so I've been looking at the kinds of changes that happen to planets and trying to characterize the change that's happening now on Earth mm. due to our activities in that wider uh, landscape of planetary changes, because there is really something new happening on Earth. You know, whatever your value judgment or uh, uh, assessment of, of that, or if you're optimistic or pessimistic, or uh, you love humanity, you hate humanity, I mean, you could find this whole spectrum, but, but we need to recognize that, what, that we have entered a new phase of the evolution of this planet and try to get our heads around that. So the Anthropocene is really about seeing our role on Earth in a new way. And it raises some really interesting questions, some of which I think um, are very germane to um, perhaps the intersection between our interests. One interesting one is when did it start? When did the Anthropocene start? And there's actually a debate going on right now within geologists who are saying, well, sh is, should this be an official uh, layer in the, in the geologic strata? You know, you, you know about these words, the Jurassic, the Triassic, and uh, you know, all these phases, the Pleistocene, um, there's eras, there's epochs, I won't get into all that, but there's, you know, they're saying, should we recognize that we are no longer in the Holocene epoch, but we're now in the Anthropocene, and if so, then when did it start? And so geologists are debating this, and there's a few different ideas about this, and one that I used to, to like, but I don't think I do <laughs> as much anymore, is the notion of defining it from the, the date of the first atomic bomb tests. Um, because, you know, there's, a, there's a, uh, a metaphorical potency to that uh, horrible um, power, and it also makes a clean geologic um, signature. There's an isotopic signature that will be recognizable for millions of years. And then there's the idea of starting it at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, when we started to really pump CO2 in the atmosphere and change the landscape so dramatically. And then, but there's also the idea of uh, now of starting it much earlier, what some people are calling the Paleoanthropocene, that, that if you look really at when humans started changing the landscape and even really changing the climate, it was many thousands of years ago uh, because, uh, you know, agriculture, um, slash and burn, clearing land, and that actually starts to act, change the climate in a variety of ways once people started doing agriculture. So it's an interesting debate, and to my mind, it doesn't really matter when they define that beginning moment. Each of those is an interesting stage in the development of human influence on the world. But, the, you know, another question that arises uh, out of this notion of the Anthropocene is more um, some interesting ethical choices about what we should do with the world. And, uh, you know, recognizing that in some sense uh, we are, you know, whether we deserve the role or not, we are in the role of doing things to the world. And even that is sort of, you know, people want to reject that, but it's, that I think is a fact. Now, so, uh, you know, people say, well, I don't like the Anthropocene. Well, who likes it really? But like, that's not the point. The point is, here we are, what do we do with it? And so there's a lot of interesting questions that have been raised about uh, conservation. And was there actually ever a time when there was human civilization, when humans weren't changing the world in profound ways. And if we start to look at that, it's not so easy when you think of conservation as trying to return the world to some pristine state. Well, when was that pristine state? If it was before humans started changing the world, then you're going really all the way back to the last ice age. Do we want to return the world to that state? If so, you're talking about Ex uh, leading, you're deliberately uh, leading to the extinction of a lot of species. If you really want to return the world to a state before humans were changing it, then you're going to have to wipe out a lot of species. And do we want to just get rid of invasive species? Are invasive species bad? Well, at this point, there are invasive species that can only exist because they're invasive. So again, 
that would mean you are okay with and desire to cause a lot of species to go extinct if you want to get rid of invasive species, including humanity, big invasive species. Right. So, <laughs> so when you start to really look at the goals of conservation in light of the real history of human influence and the real extent of human influence in the world now, it's, it's not so clean cut to, you know, there's this nostalgic notion of, um, of returning to this I ideal state that maybe never really existed. And so there's this new movement now of eco-pragmatism of saying, okay, well, let's look at the world the way it really is and what do we value? Let's think not about the past, but about the future. Um, and this has caused a lot of controversy because people think that that's sort of giving, giving up, giving in, saying we're not going to try to con conserve. But um, it's, you know, there are other others who say, actually, that's the only real responsible way that we can proceed. So um, I could say, say more about that. The, the, the last thing I'll say, because I want to stop talking and just let the conversation go, is that, is that as part of my effort to wrestle with these questions, I've been thinking a lot about the metaphors we use to describe human, human influence on the earth. And there are a lot of very, very negative metaphors for obvious reasons. Disease, we're a cancer on the earth, we're a virus. Crimes, we're raping the rainforest, we're, you know. Uh, and, and, and all of these have a, have a, you know, you can understand where they come from. There's a lot of truth to that. And yet, I think that there's a certain danger of fatalism and nihilism if we just don't take it any farther than, yeah, we're terrible, that's it. Mm -hmm. No, what do we want to be? Mm -hmm. And who can we be? What can we be? And so I've been thinking about more positive metaphors that, you know, in a certain sense, we're at this adolescent stage of just realizing our powers and realizing that, wow, we've been making quite a mess and we've got some responsibility here. And, you know, and, uh, another one is, is um, that I like is of, a, you know, a m picture, um, someone driving down the road in a, in a big bus or a big um, semi truck and, and sort of wake up and you're driving this thing <laughs> and you've never driven before and you realize, well, I don't know how to drive, but I'm driving at high speed and there's a lot of precious creatures in the back and, you know, what do I do? It's like kind of like on the fly, we have to assume this role that we maybe don't deserve, uh, really don't know how to, uh, execute, but still we have no choice because we are in some sense managing a world now. Mm -hmm. um, okay, well, I'll, I'll stop at that for now. Yeah, well, let's, let's unpack some of this a little bit. We tend to kind of go into some more depth. I think one thing that strikes me is that in both the Anthropocene and in the uh, literature about the Amazon, we're, we're confronting the loss of a myth. So we're confronting the loss of something that maybe never even existed to begin with. Um, is there some usefulness in that for us? Does that, does that add, does that bring value somehow to both of these conversations about global climate change and, and a sort of a local change in the environment or, or sort of what's, what's going on there um, from your perspective? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I've been doing some research on the idea of nostalgia throughout time. And um, in general, nostalgia has been seen as a very negative attribute because it implies an uncritical vision of history, right? If you're nostalgic for something, you see it through rose-tinted glasses and think things were always better. Um, however, I seek to have um, a, a broader version of nostalgia that sees it really as a form of critique, right? You can have a critical nostalgia in which you think things that happened in earlier times may have been better than what's happening right now. And in fact, some of the authors that I work on treat nostalgia as a critical tool. Um, so I, I think in some senses, um, you could reclaim nostalgia as a powerful tool for thinking about what we want the earth to look like. Um, however, there's another part of me that's against that idea, specifically because um, I think that nostalgia and the idea of um, things that we don't know much about, like what were certain areas of the earth like before uh, humans arrived or before we really started changing the environment, um, when we don't know what that is, we think of it as a static environment. We think of things as having always been the same. 
Um, and that's completely not true, um, especially in the case of Amazonia, which has um, constantly shifting river channels and flood seasons. Um, and so that the landscape changes to in an unrecognizable way, even in one season, let alone in several thousand years. Um, so I think that it can be very liberating for us um, in response to your question, to let go of that idea of a static, pristine past and to say, yes, we have always been altering our environment. Um, and so in the sense, we've always been driving the bus that you were just mentioning. Um, and so that can be a way for us to take ownership over it as opposed to seeking, chasing that dream, mm -hmm. right, of El Dorado or of a uh, rewilding or formerly pristine time. Is there nostalgia in the Anthropocene? Is that, do you think that's part of what's forming that discussion? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that that's right because, um, I mean, you can't be a human being with a, a brain and a heart and look around our world and not feel a sense of loss and um, tragedy about, you know, we are uh, in, the, in the midst of a mass extinction. And so, uh, you can understand that impulse to want that to stop, to want to go back, hit rewind. No, wait, this is wrong. Let's go back to some time before this was happening. So I think that nostalgia in that sense comes from a good place of valuing mm -hmm. things that are being lost. But as you said uh, very nicely, the myth of a static earth in the past or in the future is, is just that. Um, and the earth has always been changing and, and always will be. And so there is no time you can point to where things were just right. I mean, it's true that humanity has been lucky and that we've, our civilization has evolved in a relative, unusual, relatively stable and relatively warm climate phase since that last ice age. And that has perhaps given, contributed to this sense of, uh, oh, there's the stable, time and place if we could only go there. But when we look at the longer term history of the earth, we see it's just an unrelenting pattern of change and climate goes up and down and the sea level rises and falls. The thing that's unusual about our time is the rate at which we're changing all these things. Earth has been warmer, sea level has been higher, the ocean has been acidified before. Earth can handle these things, but it's never ever had to deal with the rate at which we're changing all these things. And that's why this current mass extinction is so scary. We don't know where it's leading. But similarly to not trying to go back to some past where things were static and wonderful, I think it would be foolish to imagine a future where everything, that's not to me the goal, but at least to understand our role well enough so that we're not sending things off the charts and we can roll with the punches of the earth a bit more. And it's a little more controversial, this notion of geoengineering in its most radical formulation, you know, just saying, well, let's just take control of everything and, you know, put stuff in the atmosphere and change the climate and do all this and that, you know, unintended consequences. We have to be wary of that. But in the long run, it may well be that as we gain the wisdom to fully understand the world and our role in it, that we will want to do some long-term tinkering because the earth is a place of change and eventually there will be another ice age. And maybe that wouldn't be such a good thing. And we might want to do something about that. Fortunately, we have a few thousand years to <laughs> hopefully ga gain the knowledge and wisdom. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, I think one of the first steps is dispensing of this sort of nostalgic ideal of a, w of a static, perfect world that never has and never will exist. Yeah. And in our conversations um, prior to today, we've also, uh, you've brought up this idea about being the last and um, the last to witness the Amazon as it was, the last to remember the planet Earth before it had been completely despoiled by humanity. Um, is that at, st at work here too in the, in the work that you're studying? And if, if so, what's at stake there? Um, well, as you mentioned, what I have noticed um, in writings about the South American frontier is that in the colonial era, there was a huge emphasis on being the first to arrive at a place. Every single person who wrote about their adventures in the wilderness found some way in which they were the first. Um, and uh, I have actually traced that back to um, even I in Plato's Republic, he talks about something called thymos, which is the desire for human recognition. 
So every and it, and it has some of its roots in Olympic games um, and and competitive sports. So there's always a, a desire to be first in Western civilization. Um, what I have noticed is that, um, and excuse me, I should say that extends um, to very sexualized metaphors in colonial writing as well. Um, Sir Walter Raleigh famously wrote to Queen Elizabeth that Guiana, um, where he thought El Dorado was located, um, hath yet her maiden head, making a very explicit sexual reference, both to his virgin queen um, and talking about the nature of, of Earth itself. What we see now in more contemporary writings is the myth of being the last. I think that writing about the rainforest has leapfrogged from being the first to being the last person to see this tribe, plant, or animal before it is extinct. Um, and that also is a myth. I want to put that out there. Um, I work on an author named Milton Hatoum, who's Brazilian. And in one of his recent novels, he has a character who um, has become a tour guide for tourists in the Amazon. And one of them says, I want you to take me to see some Indians. And the narrator says, well, all you have to do is look around at the people in this city. You know, they, every, humanity is also changing and evolving. Um, it doesn't always have to be um, people who are nude, like El Dorado, um, or beating drums, but rather that humanity changes just as the planet does too. So I think that the idea of being the last is a myth, just like the idea of being first. Yeah, it's interesting, this notion of, of <coughs> lasts and firsts and, and thinking about the Anthropocene and the way that you know, we're entering this new era. Um, the, um, you know, f for me in my life, one of the, the defining early moments was um, when I was in fourth grade and the um, uh, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin landed on the moon and that, you know, kind of literally blew my mind and, and <laughs> set me on the course I'm on today. <laughs> and um, that was a first, obviously, a big first. Um, in the tradition of, you know, f first to get to South America, first Europeans to get here and there or whatever. Um, but it was also part of a last in that, um, you know, th there's a lot of irony with the Apollo program, of course, that it was uh, the result of this sort of um, the epitome of this deadly competition between the United States and the Soviet Union. You know, our, our missiles are better than your missiles. We'll show you. We'll get to the moon. And this also shows that we could blow you to kingdom come, by the way. You know, so there's, but on the other hand, the Apollo a program gave us so much knowledge and gave us this picture of the earth looking back the earth rise picture yeah. you know was the beginning yeah. of this dawning of of consciousness of, about our our planet and so in thinking about our challenge now um you know what is what is our apollo right because for all its mixed um checkered um history and or or, or just the, the the different ethical layers that that, that i alluded to um it was this, this project that united us, at least as Americans. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that in a certain sense, you know, our, our project, you know, our challenge on that scale needs to be global and it needs to be, we need to become the first, uh, you know, generation or few generations that really comes to grip with tackling the, uh, the building of a, of a global society that doesn't, um, eat its seed corn and, you know, sort of dis destroy the world that sustains it. Uh, and that's, you know, it's, it's a pretty big challenge. It's arguably a much bigger challenge than getting to the moon. And hopefully it's something that, uh, you know, will um, increasingly engage and inspire people, maybe partly out of fear, which Apollo was partly out of fear. The Russians were scary, but partly out of um, seeking something, something, uh, a goal that we, uh, you know, that we feel is worthwhile enough to kind of pull together and rally ourselves. Yeah, and I think that that human desire for recognition and to be first can have a lot of very positive outcomes as well. Um, there's a, a scholar of history named John Hemming who wrote that the search for El Dorado, even though it was technically um, a failure, led to a vast amount of knowledge about the world that we live in, even though people were just looking for gold. Um, they found a lot of other arguably more interesting things along the way. Yeah, and, 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 you know, I mean, it, when I talk about Terra Sapiens, it's, it's uh, you know, 
it may seem like this this sort of utopian vision, and and mm -hmm. and maybe it is an, an El Dorado. But maybe hopefully in the same way, the search for it will lead to right. something useful. Because uh, I actually ultimately I don't think it's really um, necessarily utopian. Where I'm not saying that we need a perfect world in order to be sustainable and learn how to be a technological civilization that that has legs mm -hmm. that can last. We just need to get good and good enough in certain ways at at managing ourselves you know there were always there will always be people that don't get with the program and you know bad actors and rogue societies or whatever but that that may be okay I mean if you look at if you look at the complexity of an actual ecosystem at the global biosphere somehow uh, you know it's not uh, it's not uniform but it's but it's united and I think that that ought to be our model people think about globalization and global governance which are both things that in a certain sense we need to survive this and yet they, they have this idea that well that means everything's going to be uniform and we're going to wipe out cultural difference and all this stuff and that's you know that doesn't sound good but again if you think about how nature does it the global biosphere is an integrated whole and yet it's, it's not at all uniform <laughs> so um, it, it, it may not necessarily be um, the sort of utopian ideal it may just be a matter of shifting to a new mode of messy existence. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I'll say one more, I'll throw out one more question and then we'll get to the audience and make sure that um, we get microphones around so people can ask their questions. But um, because we have an astrobiologist here, I, I have to ask about um, if there's wilderness on other planets. Yeah. And um, you know, wilderness is a construct that we've created here on Earth and it strikes me that the definition has changed over time, what we consider to be wilderness. Um, and it's always been about going into the next frontier to explore. Um, but increasingly, we might have the possibility to uh, leap into further frontiers on other planets. And is there a wilderness as we know it there? And if we go into those places, um, what are we searching for metaphorically? I know what we could be searching for physically, but in terms of the sort of searching for the, the lost city of gold, are we searching for uh, the lost city of gold um, on exoplanets next? Or, you know, what do you think about that? Yeah, no, I'm glad you asked that because actually when Charlotte was <laughs> giving her introductory remarks and she said, well, now we know there is no hidden secret um, world out there, I was thinking, well, don't you watch Star Trek? No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> um, it's I, a very powerful <laughs> myth. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, uh, you know, actually, um, of course, there there, there, in a sense, there may be on other worlds. We don't know, and that's where the driving, qu that's the driving question of astrobiology. But it is interesting, you know, to sort of uh, psychoanalyze my own profession and say, well, are we just continuing the El Dorado, you know, that need for some mythical world elsewhere? And maybe we are, but on the other hand, we have um, plausible reasons to to think it might exist. And of course, what is it? Because again, it's not going to be some perfect, you know, place where the, uh, you know, the creatures just throw gold particles on other tentacles <laughs> and that's all they wear, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, and so we don't um, know. It might be. So. Uh, <laughs> but 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 I suppose um, you know, to the extent that maybe we need some unknown wilderness out there, and yet the Earth has obviously become, uh, whether we like it or not, sort of in a certain sense, fully known to us. We, like you said, we have Google Earth, but we don't have Google. Well, we do have Google Mars, but we don't have Google, you know, all those exoplanets out there that we only still know as little pale dots, and we don't even know if they're pale blue dots mm -hmm. yet. So. Mm -hmm. um, I'd be curious, before we go to the question, Charlie, if you have a, a thought about how a humanist would view the uh, expanse into the wilderness of space. Ooh, well, I think that um, the first thing you need to do there is define wilderness. Um, because people define it differently. For some, it's just an untouched place. And if that's true, then I would say that doesn't exist. Um, but if you're willing to see uh, wilderness even as a place where humans and nature interact, I think that the whole world could suddenly become your wilderness. Um, and as you look for it on other planets, you could see it as in a more holistic way there. Um, and I think that what that's one of the major concerns about Amazonian writers right now. There's a very wide gulf between people from outside of Amazonia who want to come and fix the plants um, and the animals. And then there's people for writing from within Amazonia who 
um, and to my mind, understand that there has to be a relationship between the people who are already living there. Because when you're already living there, it's not an adventure. Um, it's not a search. It's your life. Um, and so uh, I had the opportunity to travel to Brazil during my time here and interview a Brazilian author um, who told me very frankly, we don't want Greenpeace here. We want a sociological and economic plan for how we're going to live in harmony with what we have. Um, so I, I think that that outlook can be extended to life on other planets as well. Well, and, and to the whole Earth. I mean, what you just said they want, that's kind of what I want for the planet. I want a sociological and economic, economic plan, plan Good for, idea. for how we're going to live with what we have. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's well, this is why we need to have humanities and the sciences working together as we push into this next century. Um, so let's take a few questions. I hope that there are some from the audience. Um, I see one over there. I actually have one question for each of the speakers. One, uh, for Professor Rogers, do we have any idea about the history of the El Dorado myth, i.e., uh, it shows up when, when the Spaniards talk and Portuguese talk to the Indians. Do we know how much variations there are in El Dorado myths in different Indian tribes and also whether there are pre-proto pre myths as to what, I mean, the, the emphasis on gold makes me wonder whether the Spanish projected their own values on. And for uh, Dr. Greenspan, uh, Greenspoon, um, do you say that what we're doing right now is unprecedented, has unprecedented velocity? And I agree, but on the other hand, Mother Nature, has, has uh, Mother Nature provided some rather uh, abrupt shocks, the asteroid or deck and trap events produced uh, extinctions on a very fast scale? Okay, um, well, to answer your question about the historical record about the indigenous myth of El Dorado, um, we are, we confront the same problem um, with El Dorado as we do with any um, legends from an unwritten culture, um, which is that we have only one side of the story, uh, which is what the British, German, French, uh, Spanish, and Portuguese um, uh, people who arrived there were able to write down about what they saw. Um, and not only is translation a huge issue, but so is motivation. Um, I think that Amazonia is often more of a mirror or a palimpsest in which outsiders see themselves rather than um, uh, giving us any true idea of what was actually there. So a more specific um, answer, uh, is in addition to just saying we're not really sure, is that um, in 1539 is when the words El Dorado first appear um, in written um, uh, chronicles of the New World by Gonzalo de la Peña. Um, and almost immediately afterwards, about 10 years later, there was someone else who said that uh, that leader didn't really exist, but there was a place where um, the the streets of Amazonia were littered with golden nuggets and jewels as if they were pebbles. Um, and so because those travelers were always looking for gold and were always asking about gold, they interpreted their indigenous counterparts' answers as having to do with gold and riches. So when they say, this indigenous person told me there was gold over there, that's really what he wanted to hear. <laughs> um, so there's some written record, but it's all in Spanish and Portuguese, um, and that's I as good as we can get from that perspective. Yeah, and, and, and to answer uh, the question, the question was, uh, I said that what's unprecedented about now is the rate at which we're changing all these, but the questioner astutely points out that there have been some very dramatic, um, catastrophic changes in Earth history. It's true. What's, what's unusual about now is that all these things are changing at once. The surface of the land, the reflectivity, the sea ice, the uh, global temperature, the acidification of the ocean, the, uh, and I c the list goes on. But it's true. Uh, uh, there have been abrupt changes. And, and um, for instance, there was the, the big asteroid that hit famously at the boundary of the Cretaceous and the Tertiary. And another one was uh, 250 million years ago, um, between the, the Permian and the Triassic, there was this massive uh, flooding of volcanic gases into the atmosphere when the Siberian traps formed. But if you look at how we describe 
those two transitions in Earth history, there's a common word in them. It's not just the Cretaceous Tertiary or the Permal Triassic. We talk about the Cretaceous Tertiary extinction and the Permal Triassic extinction. The two greatest extinctions in Earth history are associated with abrupt change. So don't try this at home. <laughs> <laughs> we have a question here in the middle. Uh, Travis, come around with the mic. My question, even before this uh, point, uh, was I, you've talked about the beginning of the Anthropocene. And I wondered if you, I think this is for both of you, could comment about the possible end of the Anthropocene. And uh, I'm basing that on the fact that we're all very conceited. We think, well, finally, humans have come along and we're, having, we're getting going in fits and starts, but we're going to fix things and we'll have an El Dorado in the end. Mm -hmm. And is that inevitable? Hmm. I'll let you go. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's a, it's a great question. In fact, to me, it's the motivating question of, of my particular study of the Anthropocene is the question, where is this all going? And, um, you know, is it conceited? Some people think even the notion of the Anthropocene is conceited. That who are we to say, that to name a geological age after ourselves? Um, but on the other hand, one could say it's recognizing, as I said before, the world we actually live in, that we're a new phenomenon on Earth. We're part of a new phenomenon on Earth, for better or worse. And there are a lot of reasons to think that perhaps it won't last very long. If you look at the different stages in Earth history that have names in the geologic columns, some of them are brief events. The Cretaceous Tertiary boundary that I mentioned is a centimeter thick layer of clay left over from that asteroid. Um, and it was actually a very brief excursion in climate of probably maybe just really a few years that collapsed the uh, global food cycle, or et cetera, and led to all these extinctions. Um, so um, that's an event. The Anthropocene could be an event in Earth history. If we just simply continue some of our current practices and just burn every last bit of fossil fuel and cut down every last bit of Amazon and all these things, then it most likely, and, and one could go on with the things that we are on track to do, then it could be an event, a brief event. But um, interestingly, it's a new kind of experiment, and one can, even c one can at least conceive of ways in which we have tools for survival that no species has ever had. The dinosaurs didn't see that asteroid coming. We actually are not in danger of that kind of extinction because we now are at, because we, unlike the dinosaurs, we have a space program. And <laughs> if there was an asteroid coming our way, we could divert it. And we don't really have to worry probably about a new ice age, um, like the, um, so some of these other extinctions. So, you know, the, the asteroid that we have to um, divert is ourselves. So it's an unprecedented, challenge. No other kinds of species has faced it. And there's at least the possibility of, uh, of learning to deal with that, of doing what human beings have always done, which is respond to challenges by acting collectively and inventing new solutions. So uh, you may not think that's likely, you may think it's likely, but the fact that no species, you know, that the average length of um, longevity of a species you know, is some number of millions of years, doesn't necessarily apply to us. The rules have changed. It could mean that our tenure is unusually short, but there's other possibilities too. Yeah, and uh, my perspective as a literary scholar is that every generation believes that it is living through a moment of crisis. Um, so I've been spending my time here at the Kluge Center reading books with the word last in the title, The Last Forest the last of the tribe, the land of ghosts. Um, and so there's this long heralding of the end of things. And I think that is true only if you think that um, the idea of a static world is essential. And so if you, uh, I would like to write a book not called the last, but called the changing Amazon or the changing world. And so d it going forward, um, it might just be a slightly different looking planet um, to be more optimistic, if I'm able, um, rather than just the last of something. I think we have a hard time recognizing that we could be in the middle of things. <laughs> it's not very, you know, sexy to be in the middle. 
Yeah. Well, I could say as a middle child, it's always been difficult. <laughs> yeah. To uh, let's go back. We have uh, a question over on this side. Travis can pick whoever. Hi. So you've spent some time debunking this sort of myth of the virgin, pristine, static wilderness. Mm -hmm. um, but places that we refer to as wilderness are sort of tangibly different on the ground than cities or something like that. And so I'm curious how you would maybe redefine wilderness to oh. acknowledge those values and how that can be useful to us, how a, a redefinition of wilderness could be useful to us in a changing world. Wow, that's a great question. Um, I think that uh, defining wilderness might be the key to helping us break free from some of those polarizing dichotomies um, in the way that we've seen the world. Like if um, Amazonia, this is my example, has always been seen either as a terrestrial paradise, Colum Christopher Columbus in 1498 declared that the terrestrial paradise was located at the headwaters of the Orinoco River in Amazonia. So he said, paradise is right there. Um, the other metaphor that's always used to describe Amazonia is as the green hell. So you literally have those absolute two sides. Um, I think that the uh, a useful definition of wilderness would be something in the middle of that. Um, but not being a scientist or an ecologist, um, I feel like I'm outside of, of my uh, depth there. But I would say that the writers that I look at all seek to understand the landscape in a way that it relates to people. So whatever definition you have has to incorporate both humans and plant and animal life. And the rivers, of course, um, in Amazonia. So David, you, you would take a better stab at that as well, I don't know about writer. better. Um, that, that's a great question. That, that was a great answer. Um, you know, I think when we talk about the myth of wilderness, we're coming to recognize that if you define wilderness as a place completely beyond human touch, human interference, there's no such thing. You know, there are places that seem like it, but in fact, if you go to them and you sample the atmosphere, you'll find out that, oh, you know, these gases don't stop at the fence of the na national park or whatever. But right. certainly, there are places with a lot of wildness, uh, you know, parks and forests and, yeah, I mean, not park like out here on the mall, it's, although it's very nice, but <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, the national parks and you can get lost in the forest for days. And um, I just recently moved here from Colorado and one of the things that's great about that is there are, it's not hard from even Denver to get with, uh, in a short drive, um, you know, in your polluting automobile <laughs> to, <laughs> to, to a place that feels, it, it feels like wilderness. You know it's not, but there's that sense of wildness that, um, that feels important both because of what it does to us and because of the sense that uh, it, it's sustaining aspects of our world that we, we want to sustain. And so I think we need to think about what it is about those places that we value. And I mean, national parks are a good example because you go in, you know, hike in Rocky Mountain National Park or Yosemite or somewhere and you feel like, ah, oh, I'm in the wilderness. And you're not really, because those places it turns out are highly managed. Correct. You know, they're all highly managed. If they weren't, you know, a lot of the species wouldn't be there because, they, you know, these guys would have eaten these guys and these <laughs> trees would have been gnawed to bits. And so mm -hmm. they're, they're actually highly managed to maintain that sense. And in a sense, maybe that's a metaphor for what we need to do with our world. You know, we can't and we probably don't want to just make ourselves disappear. So therefore, we have to think about what we value in these wild places and how to integrate that into the world. So I don't know if the term wilderness will get redefined or abandoned or, you know, retained as, as something we realize is, is a myth. But I think the, the qualities in those places that feel like wilderness to us, the wildness of places is something that we value and we ought to think really hard about how to integrate that into this world we're creating. Yeah. I'm going to use moderator prerogative and just add a two second comment, which is I think also, um, we, we privilege certain types of ecosystems to be wilderness in the first place. And there's lots of uh, interesting flora and fauna right in the backyard of my parents' house. Um, and there's a little ecosystem there. Um, but does that get as much status as the, some of these more pristine areas of wilderness that we're trying to protect? Is it possible to protect all of it or do we have to make choices about what we define as wilderness and then what we then put policies in place to protect? Sort of yeah, we, we, we have to make choices, but I think, I think you're right that, that uh, we should not neglect 
the nature that is around us and in our built environments and that that's part of the key to this this world that we're trying to create this terra sapiens if you will is to um, figure out how to integrate that and not uh, not just live with this false dichotomy of the human world and the natural world but realize it's all of a piece and how can we uh, you know keep keep a relationship with the nature in fact even in our urban places uh, we have time for a few more questions. I'm going to go, we went this way to this way, so we'll come back around to this side again and then go back through again. So, uh, Tom? Um, you might have to help me articulate this. Uh, Charlotte, it, it seems to me that there might be parallels between the myth of El Dorado and the other myth of the noble savage. Mm. That, you know, Europeans were looking in the New World for this Rousseauian innocent creature just as they were looking for a geographic place of paradise they were looking for paradise within human nature that they thought could be re recovered and uh, that's a persistent myth I, i'm thinking of you know the reevaluation of margaret mead's work mm -hmm. in recent decades and the reevaluation of the i guess the the myth of you know North American or South American Indians living in complete ecological harmony with the forest and not disturbing a twig and the evidence is that well they were kind of wasteful too except their technology wasn't as good as ours for being really wasteful mm -hmm. um, that might be something to pursue uh, and, and David in terms of <laughs> loss of the myth for astrobiology you know we, we jason was talking about star wars and you know with star trek whatever at, at some point you know we, we have to realize you know the speed of light has not been repealed uh even with the web telescope the pr probably the best we're going to be able to do is analyze light spectra or something like that we're not going to be able to go to these places we're not going to be able to communicate with anybody. There's a quarantine there. And I wonder if that might be the disillusionment in astrobiology that is inevitable. Mm. Um, well, uh, Tom, to answer your question, I think that w one distinguishing feature that both Rousseau's idea of the noble savage um, and the myth of El Dorado have in common is that they were both invented by French philosophers. <laughs> Um, so uh, Voltaire wrote um, in his famous satire Candide about the kingdom of El Dorado um, where justice was always served and he used it as a foil to France specifically just as Rousseau uses this myth of the noble savage to critique contemporary France. Um, and I think that's true of most of the things we think of Amazonia. We think of it as a different, another place, um, as a wild place. Uh, so we would do a lot better to think of wilderness as something that's all around us um, in the same way that we could see it as an imaginary place that we could create wherever we are. And I would be even more radical and say that you could go out to Stanton Park and see that as wilderness if you were willing to manage it and cultivate it and retain your sense of wonder in it. Um, that would be a good place to start <laughs> as you go forward. Um, so I do think that it would does people in Amazonia a disservice to see them as either noble or savage um, and to see them rather as people with driving motivations just like everyone else I think would, would help move things beyond those polarizing um, dichotomies that we talked about, about uh, savagery and civilization. So, which, you know, people started doing with Joseph Conrad, and I hope that we can pr keep progressing in that direction. Yeah, your, your point is well taken about the, uh, the city park. There's wildness there, certainly, if you get down in the dirt and have a microscope, and <laughs> you know, you'll find a lot of exotic beasties, and uh, <laughs> we have to value value the wildness everywhere. Uh, that, that's, that, that's also a, a really good point about, you know, the sort of Star Trek myth is almost maybe a modern kind of El Dorado myth that, yes, uh, as an astrobiologist, I believe it's likely that there is life on other worlds and probably so-called intelligent life elsewhere somewhere and that we have the ability potentially to detect it and that we, you know, it's a very exciting 
uh, prospect that I, there's no logical, rational reason why that isn't possible and why we shouldn't try to find it. But the Star Trek notion that, yeah, th for this episode, we're going to go to this world and find, you know, this interesting uh, foil for, for ourselves and the inhabitants there. That is maybe a modern kind of El Dorado myth. You're, you're right, it's not going to happen that way unless we discover some really radical new physics that, does, that I'm not holding my breath for. Uh, I, I, I would possibly dispute the notion that interstellar travel and contact is completely impossible. That could be a longer discussion some other time. But you're right, it's impossible for us uh, in that any creature that has a lifespan of 100 or thereabouts years, um, given physics and given the distances to the stars, is not going to themselves go there. Now, if we had the lifespan of bristlecone pines, um, and s some really advanced um, kinds of propulsion that doesn't break the laws of physics, that might be a slightly different equation. Um, and so I wouldn't say it's impossible for all creatures in the universe, uh, but that's not really what you were getting at. But we, you and I will never go to these worlds, and yet we think about them and uh, use them as a foil for what we think about our world in ways that are maybe useful. And in that sense, uh, maybe they are our modern Eldorados. I don't know. We'll take two more. We got one here and then we got one over there. Right there, next to you. Yeah. Um, so this idea of, um, you know, wilderness, um, putting aside um, utopias of justice or big wealth um, and just focusing on nature, um, it seems to, um, I think, that um, an idea of an, I an ideal of wilderness is, to my mind, still very viable, um, a, a reality, um, and I think uh, some there is some effort in some corners to rebuild um, um, contiguous um, areas of wilderness because it's found that. There's so many species that are not viable unless there is this um, continuity mm -hmm. of wilderness areas. And that's why, I mean, the Amazon is an area, maybe the biggest area on Earth where there are the largest contiguous areas. Um, it, I mean, in Europe, um, the I think maybe it was in the Stone Age, I was reading somewhere that that was when um, uh, all the large species were killed off. And um, I mean, there's also an issue of farming, which, which destroys, I, and, uh, w destroys nature. Um, and as to f a definition of wilderness, maybe we could think of where there's unexplored um, complexity of, um, of biology. Yeah, um, I can say uh, about Amazonia, and then maybe let you take it to a more interstellar level, um, <laughs> is that w one of the things that we know about Amazonia is how much we don't know. Um, there's an idea of there are so many uncatalogued species of things, particularly ants, um, I can think of off the top of my head, that, we, that haven't been classified and named and cataloged, and that many of them may be um, being eliminated right now because of what's going on or what has been happening in the Amazon. So that w we may know some of what we're losing, but we don't know everything that we have. Um, and so I think that th that can be a very useful thing to remember as we look towards um, being a careful managers and stewards of, of the place that we live. So. Um, I think that the idea of building fences around things and not letting anyone in might be short-sighted, even though it's very gratifying in a sort of physical way. Um, but it helps us reflect upon um, the things that we don't know about what we're losing and how they're changing. And we're running short on yeah. time, so I'm okay. going to try to make a quick, quick comment, yeah. and then we'll do our Well, I like this idea of unexplored complexity. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure, I mean, whether we call it wilderness or not is, is uh, it's semantics, but it's something to be valued and not necessarily unexplored in the sense that we can see it from Google Earth, but there's so much there in the interactions that we don't understand. And science can sometimes be arrogant and feel like we've got it all figured out, but we're still discovering so much that we don't know about life and the discoveries about our own microbiome and the organisms, the world's living within us are brand new and 
and there's so much surely about the Amazon and these other places that we, that we don't know. Uh, you know, on the other hand, your example of a, of a migration corridor is interesting. It's true. We've got to connect these. We're learning that, we, that, that these seem some, somewhat wild places need to be connected in order for animals to migrate and be able to live and so forth. But in a certain sense, that's a management project, right? That's a very much us saying, well, we've learned this about these species. We're going to take control, and you can build there, but you can't build there because, you know, right. these butterflies or these elk fish, need, fish these fish need to, to migrate. And so that's an interesting example of preserving that unexplored wildness and yet managing its contours to, to use what we have learned about the natural world to uh, help, help it along to some extent. And so, uh, you know, that's... That's sort of preserving wilderness, but it's also sort of park management. Mm -hmm. We're running short on time, so we're going to take one more question. Um, but uh, I know some people may have to get back to their desks. Uh, it is noontime, so I just want to quickly remind you that uh, Charlotte is giving her final lecture about her research here at the Kluge Center on uh, Thursday, June 19th at 12 p.m. And so please do sign up on our list uh, on your way out to get more information about that and future programs. One more short question from the corner there, and then we'll have to wrap it up. Thank you. Hi. Um, you've both touched on the fact that in so many like human proposals of what the future could be are so dichotomized into like you know option A, utopia versus option B, apocalypse versus mm -hmm. sometimes an option C of complacency. And I'm really interested in how you think that your work of debunking maybe unhealthy ideas of what the wilderness is could affect human perceptions or visualizations of the future? Ooh. Um, Tough last short question. No, that's it. That's a great... <laughs> um, I, I think that uh, on a more philosophical level, breaking free of stereotypes is one of the most lofty and difficult human goals out there. Um, so to see a forest or a woman as not either virgin or fallen, um, but somewhere in the middle is is really challenging. And that's why maybe I would take on the middle as the new sacred ground that we should be aiming for. Um, it, it's not as appealing as being the first or the last, um, but it might be much more productive um, in that sense. And in terms of what that means in terms of scientific or wildlife management, I'm not really sure, but I think it's a good place to start. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's a good question. It's provocative. I'll, I'll try to keep this brief. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think a lot about the role of science. And there's a lot of debate now about what role scientists should play because um, we are in some sense in a planetary emergency, but it's an unusual, it's a slowly unfolding emergency. Um, and, uh, and so there's a lot of debate about should scientists be activists and chain themselves to the White House gate, or is it more just our role to try to maintain objectivity and to say how things are, but you know, not, not get involved. And I think, I think either extreme there is sort of dangerous, but um, one thing that I've come to believe more and more is that as scientists, just by describing the world accurately the way it really is, we can help because the world really is a unity that we act within and this sort of global and intergenerational long-term worldview is the natural worldview one comes to when one studies what science reveals to us with these orbital imaging tools and so forth. And so, um, so, so there, there, there's, sorry, I'm losing my train of thought at just mm -hmm. the wrong time. The, the um, here, say your question again, just briefly. <laughs> oh yeah, so how does the, yeah. Yeah, so I think that um, we don't necessarily um, need to um, take control of the world in the sense of envisioning and creating some perfectly engineered world. But we do need to shed ourselves of some of these ideas about, you know, the world being infinite, that we can have no effect you know, and even in just a couple of generations, we've transformed from that view that the world's infinite, what we do really doesn't matter. Some people still believe that, of course, that humans, how, how could we, but that's wrong. The evidence, there's certain things science can say with confidence, and one of them is that that view is wrong. And so, therefore, I think shedding, shedding some of those incorrect ideas 
about the world that um, the myth that, that it's infinite and imperturbable um, and the myth similarly though that it, um, that it was once this, this perfect place that we just have to get back to. You know, those will getting rid of those ideas will help us. And also, I think seeing the world the way it really is, this is, this is what I find comfort in, okay? That seeing the world the way it really is, unified and unfolding over very long time scales and all is, will, will save us. All we have to do is sort of realize our proper place within that um, global long-term order that actually already exists. And, you know, instead of um, sort of acting like these children with new toys, we have to um, just kind of grow up and, and, uh, and live within the, the actual constraints of the world that, that we see around us. And on that, I think we'll have to end it. Um, thank you all so much for coming, and please thank our scholars. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.